When the Romans arrived in Iron Age Britain, they didn't just transform the country's roads, buildings and economy. Even gods and rituals were shaped by Roman influence. This field in Hertfordshire could take us into the heart of that story. It's at Friars Wash, just five miles northwest of St Albans, one of Roman Britain's major centres. The site first came to the attention of archaeologists during a hot summer in the 1970s, when an aerial survey showed up some unusual features. These squares look remarkably like the footprints of Roman temples, but these distinctive buildings are rarely found in Britain. Even Time Team, after 15 years, has yet to discover an entire Roman temple. Francis, I have a terrible sense of deja vu about this one. How many times on Time Team have we gone on day one, oh, we may have a Roman temple here, and do we get a Roman temple? Yeah, um... You mean, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> they have proved elusive, Tony. They certainly have. <laughs> but, Tony, when you've got aerial photographs of that quality with crop marks like that and you've got a plan that is a square within a square, it screams out of you. Roman temple. But even if it is a temple, we don't know that there's any of it left. It could all have been ploughed out, couldn't it? Well, look, Tony, you can see there's a definite rise in the field over there. Where Emma and Stuart are. And um, that worries me a little bit because, you know, that's where ploughing is often worked. That's but... right. But on the other side of that, where the, the plough soil moves down the slope, it could actually preserve the lower parts. OK, so what do we do? Well, uh, first of all, I mean, despite the fact we've got beautiful results on the aerial photograph, we're going to put the geophysics over it. And then once we got the results from that, we should put a trench in. Well, I thought you'd say we'd put a trench in. It is an archaeology program. Where? <laughs> well, I think you want to go straight through the middle of that temple. I mean, let's go for where we're going to discover something. Why don't we go straight through that way? After all, we've got two temples. We ought to try and establish a relationship. Yeah, I'm not worried about that now, Phil. We can sort out relationships later. Phil, You're... Phil. He's pulling rank on me. He absolutely <laughs> is. You don't ask questions, you dig. He tells you where to dig, all right? Let's get on with it. Off you go. Suddenly, it seems possible that there could be archaeology that survived plough damage. With walls emerging, everyone descends on the trench to try and work out what was once here. And by halfway through day one, our search for a Roman building seems one step closer to its goal. <laughs> A real wall this time. Absolutely. Some really, really good archaeology, Mark. And far, far better than we'd ever expected. Yeah. I mean, we thought the whole thing was going to be ploughed away. But look, I mean, we've got this superb wall coming through here. Yeah, it's substantial. It must be, what, nearly a metre wide? That's right. As far as I can see at the moment, that looks very much as though it's on the outside. Yeah. But here, you look, we've got this beautiful flooring preserved. So I think we're in the inside here. And we can yeah. trace it going back right through the yeah, whole length of the Yeah, you can see you've trench. got mortar and plaster and stuff on this side, haven't you? Absolutely. Yeah, excellent. But we haven't just got a wall. There's now also tesserae or floor tiles coming up. That's a tessera. Uh, let's see. That's a better one, isn't it? That's nice and smooth on the top and then loads of mortar on the bottom. Oh, yeah, where it was stuck in. Yeah, there is loads of them. That's one there. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have the whole floor soon. I'm sure that some of these used to be roof tile. Because there's loads sense. of roof tile. And and they're just sort of smashed up from there, I think. From the enormous number of plain tesserae emerging, we think this structure had a plain mosaic floor, which is what we'd expect from a temple building. We'd also expect concentric walls, leaving a walkway some three metres wide. And then another wall appears. Oh, look, there it is. Oh, look at that. One, two metres on the button. Hey! Oh. That's hell of a that's hell of a stride you got there. <laughs> that's hell of a lot more than two meters. One, two, I'll make that three meters. All right. Now, crucially, that is so vitally important because it's not unreasonable to assume that maybe we got two to three meters on that side. Yeah. If we can pinpoint all the outside walls and the inside walls as well, we we we're nearly there. 
This morning, you told me that on this mound, we would find this. Yeah, and we've got one, Tony. I'm sure of it. Look, right in the middle there, you see that flint wall, and it goes through a right angle in front of where Tracy's troweling. Yeah. That is the wall of a central tower, the Keller. Yeah. OK, and then behind it, you can see there's more flint. That's because it's got a raised floor, and they often had raised floors. Then on the outside, there's a walkway, which is about three metres wide, and it's got a wall. The outside wall is here. So that would be this wall here. That's that wall, and so Tracy's actually troweling in the walkway. Yeah. And then if you come round this way, yeah. the walkway wall is... In this trench here. You've got it. So that would be here? That's right, yes. Yeah. What about fines? Right. Well, what we're getting is not the sort of stuff you'd expect in a house. We're getting roof tile, we're getting bits of floor tile, but we're not getting domestic rubbish like bones, we're not getting pottery. It's a very distinctive and unusual collection of finds, the sort of thing you get in a temple. Which is what you predicted. So are we done and dusted? No, I don't think so, Tony. Um, We've got to prove it absolutely. And I think this wall coming in here and this one coming in here, they'll meet up at that point down there. So it's looking very good, but we're not quite there yet. No, we're very nearly there. If Francis is right, an entire Roman temple is just within our grasp. Henry thought we'd got two temples here. When we looked at the resistance results, it worked well with the northern temple, but it just didn't make sense with the southern temple because there was nothing in the results that would match that. Well, Stuart's actually solved it. <laughs> well, the, the problem was that Henry was trying to get the computer to do something it couldn't really do because the photograph was very oblique. So I went back to the old-fashioned techniques of a, of a ruler, an air photograph, and a straight line. You can see features on here which still exist on the ground. We've got this nice straight hedge line here. We've got a bungalow over here. And both those features still survive. And if you draw the straight line between the hedge line and the bungalow, it goes right through the middle of the two temple sites. So if you trace that line on the ground, which I've done with the poles, it goes right up the middle there. And when Francis was describing what he thought was that, you could see he was actually on this side of the line here. It couldn't be that temple. And it was clear we had one temple this side of the line, there, and we had another temple under the grass of that side. So the good news is you've still got a temple, it's just that we were digging the wrong one. That's it, Tony. Well, actually, you know, the good news is we've got two temples. So yesterday we thought we were here on the photograph, where, in fact, we were here. The man behind this mistake was Henry, who had difficulty relating the 1970s photograph to the modern field. So he now has to replot the two temples. Henry, after the fiasco of yesterday's surveying, <laughs> you'd better get this right. Of course, of course. What can go wrong, Phil? We're also still looking for evidence of ceremony outside the main buildings. And it's not long before Francis is called away to look at yet more geophys results. OK, so what have we got, John? Well, look, on the aerial photograph, we've got the two temples now. Yeah. We've got the ring feature. Mm. But if you come this way, there's a sort of splurge at that point there. We've now looked at it with resistance. So, again, follow that line between the two temples. We've got a clear high-resistance response. I mean, that suggests to me a, a sort of small building structure at this point. Well, I mean, that's where you'd expect to find one. I mean, we're in the yard outside the, the main temples, and it's in these yards, these open spaces, that that's where you get the, the sacrifices and, and, and the religious offerings. A sort of altar? Yes, an altar, something like that. But, uh, I mean, we, you know, we'll only know by putting a hole in it, so that's what we must do, I think. After lunch. Yes. So Francis decides to open a third trench over the splurge that could be an altar. While back in Phil's trench... Ah, oh, uh, there we go. ..the blob <laughs> on the geophysics is turning up trumps. Well, I'm damned. I shall get a brush, Phil, is well, the first I'm thing I'm going to do. Who would have believed that? <laughs> there you go, Phil. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Hey. So that's the mortar that it was yeah, that I it know, was bedded, I know, I into. Know, and it's just sitting in the bottom here, look. Well, isn't that nice? Phil? Uh, they're jumping up and down saying that what? you've got some kind of floor. We have, look, a little mosaic floor, look. Wow. Look, look, isn't that isn't that beautiful? That's a surprise, isn't it? Well it is, totally. So do you think that this is what John was seeing in the GFS? I'm almost certainly, yeah. 
Well, in that case, there could be a heck of a lot of it. Oh, look at that. It's a coin. <laughs> really, you couldn't ask for a better gift than a coin lying on the floor. It really is a gift. <laughs> Can you tell much about it? No, it's, it's just wafer thin. In fact, there's a hole that goes right the way through it. And I certainly don't want to... I certainly don't want to risk trying to brush it, because if there is any detail on it, I might lose it, but... That's turned it into quite a good sight, this, isn't it? Yeah, got that. Cleaning reveals the coin to be third century, meaning that Phil's mosaic floor had to have been laid before that date. Back on site, and another great find is emerging. Mark, what do you think of that? Oh, my word, look at that. It's lovely, isn't it? Now, that's in fabulous condition. That's Constantine the First, or Constantine the Great, as he's known to history. Flip it over, and it's the sun god, Sol. Isn't it fantastic to have a coin with a pagan god and it's the emperor who converts to Christianity and found on a temple site? It's just yes, a lovely little, it's, it's, little it's microcosm lovely of why we're here. Yes, isn't it? While in our temple, Bridge is extending the trench to reveal the whole keller. It's here in this sacred centre that we might expect offerings to have been left to the gods. And soon enough... What is it, Bridge? Well, it's the most beautiful oh. enameled brooch. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Oh, beautiful. Plate brooch, enamel. That green area was probably originally white enamel, but we can see that there are little spots of red here too. Second century, usually, those types. Guy. And the, the crescent on the top makes me think immediately of the moon. Yes. And if that's right, then that would mean it's the goddess Diana yes. Luna. Well, that would be great, because I've actually found it inside the cala in the temple. Ah, but it doesn't mean the temple was dedicated yeah. to her. She might just have been one of many gods or goddesses dedicated to here. Oh, but don't squash on it just yet, Guy, please. I'm not. Anyway, <laughs> it's a lovely find, isn't it? Beautiful. It's well done. Great. Tea time on day two and we're beginning to paint a vivid picture of our Romano-British temple and the very things that were part of day-to-day -day life here. But as time ticks on, we've still got a lot of questions about this site to answer. We've now dug across the huge feature on the aerial photograph that looks like three ditches, but we still don't know what it is exactly. I don't think I can remember a time team where we've had three such tasty trenches in such a small area. It's been fantastic, Tony. Well, you remember that circular thing that we thought could have been a Bronze Age barrow? Yes. Well, it turns out it's got a circular wall around the outside. It's a Roman shrine. And in the middle there, you can see the base of a, of a chalk uh, altar base made out of piled up chalk and then fitted within a box made out of wood. And over here, in this trench, we think we've got another altar, although Guy thinks it's a kiosk, but we're working on him. And over here, we've got the trench with the two temples in it. But it is tantalising, isn't it? Because it's all structures, not people. That's right, Tony. That's why we want to go down. And I think we'll actually get evidence for what was going on here, the rituals, you know, the sacrifices and things. And as a first hint, when we were going down in the keller, right up against the wall, we found this. Now, I don't know what it is. It may have gone in a little recess in the wall, but it looks to me, for all the world, like a head. Our mission to understand the people here has already unearthed important evidence. Yesterday, we found one of Time Team's most tantalising finds, a rare type of stone that we believe was chosen for the temple because it looks like a human head. It was found in the Keller, the sacred centre of the temple. And with only one day left, Bridge is now digging down into the Keller in the hope of finding yet more evidence of ritual. We've also opened a trench over what could be an altar or a kiosk for religious goods. And as day three gets underway, it's here that an archaeological deluge begins. Hi, Helen. I, I hear there's been some excitement over here. Yes, we've got a lot of bronze coins. Yeah. Now, as you know, if there's more than ten bronze coins from the single find, yeah. we need to report them under the 1996 Treasure Act. Yeah. So what I, what I want to know from you, though, is do you think that they represent a hoard? Have they gone into the ground together? Yeah. Let's have a How look. How many have we Let's got? Let's have a look. We've got two late 3rd century coins. We've got one of the early 320s. 
the majority are all between 330 and 340, 41, and there's one that we can't identify yet until it's been conserved and cleaned. In my opinion, that's a deliberate deposit, a group deposit, it's a hoard. And that means, presumably, it's gone into the ground as an offering, not, a, not as a bank to keep safe, but as we're at mm. a temple, as an offering. Oh, I think in this context, yes, it's a deliberate grouped offering. Fantastic. So excellent, and it's the kind of thing you expect to find on a temple site, and we got one. Brilliant. With archaeology appearing in the ground at every turn, the pressure's on to excavate this substantial ceremonial complex. And Stuart's been busy investigating why people chose this spot to show their devotion. Critically, our site's in a river valley, and it's also beside Watling Street, a Roman road that led to Verulamium. Guy, these were found by Faye in her trench, and she says they're curses. What does she mean? Almost every time when you come to a site, we're detached, really, from the Aboriginal people. A religious site is one of the rare occasions that you get a bit of writing, some evidence of that relationship between those people and their lives. There's no writing there. Yeah, there will be. These are rolled up sheets of lead. When they're unrolled, they'll probably have handwriting on them and it will be that message to the god saying that you want such and such a thing. What kind of things do they say? It could be incredibly petty. Imagine, for example, your cloak's been nicked or that sort of thing. You go along to the temple and you say, so-and-so's done this terrible thing to me. I plead to you, the goddess or the god, that this person has their house fall down or something horrific like that. This thing gets rolled up, it gets deposited on the temple site and the person goes away hoping, of course they paid for this, so they go away hoping that this service will be performed for them by the god or goddess and if they think that it has, they'll come back and they'll leave a gift which is the other half of the contract. So they might leave an altar here or a gift of food like that burnt bone saying, thanks very much. Are these very common? No, they're not at all. And to find some in a religious context like this is really very unusual. So people came here to make offerings and ask the gods to fulfil their desires. And if you want to know more about Roman gods, visit the Time Team website. Back in our first trench, and with just half a day left, traces uncovering a walkway visitors would have once trod. It strikes me that that walkway surface is much lower than the other ones on the site, is it? Yeah, I mean, it's lower than the ambulatory. Yeah. So, I mean, it's almost like you would have stepped up and then maybe a step up into the keller in the centre. I mean, you know, this is fascinating, but it sort of implies that the level at which you're walking is something to do with the level of sanctity of the, of the temple. So, out here on the fringes, you're lower down, you get into the ambulatory around the central keller and you're up. And then in the keller itself, you know, you're, you're quite well up and, of course, the keller is a great tower. I think there's some symbolism here that we might have missed before. A Romano-British visitor to this site would have found temples designed to inspire awe and wonder. But they'd also have encountered a mass of other people coming to pay devotion. The more this dig goes on, the more I get a picture up the far end of the field of these yes. four temples surrounded by great crowds all dancing and banging drums and the guys bare to the waist, a bit of <laughs> long hair, people putting these curses into the walls with great shouts and wails and generally everybody having a good time. Is that anything like how you think it might have been? I don't know what I can possibly add to that. It's the perfect picture. No, you're quite right. It's not like the Christian church ceremony. This is a much more, if you like, brutal pagan world, which is much closer to the landscape. It's much closer to the visible sense of death and sacrifice. It's a much harder landscape than the one we live in today. Remember, these are people who lived in permanent terror of the unpredictability of the natural world. A thunderstorm, a rainstorm, your crop being ruined, they're perpetually trying to control this through religion. On a more mundane note, what about transport? How did they get here? Another thing that's very big in the landscape here is, is Watling Street. Where is it? Um, it's, it's not the first line of trees, it's the second line. You can just about see it on the horizon. So we're, we're actually very visible from Watling Street, and so maybe that's why the temple is where it is. You you know I'm a relentless cynic. By being close to the road, it makes this place a successful commercial establishment. You've got to get the punters in, haven't you? You know what this place would have been like? The Glastonbury Festival on a really awful summer. Ooh. And how close is that to the M5? 
On site, it's now a race against time to make sense of the entire religious complex. In our third temple, Phil's finding that under his chalk base, there are no finds, but a huge flint foundation. Well, I'm getting these flints up. What's Guess what's underneath? <laughs> More chalk. So with only hours to go, he faces a tricky excavation. Next door, with time running out, Bridge has finally revealed the keller of our first temple. What you got, Bridge? Well, Tony, we now have the whole keller exposed. We've got very few finds actually coming out of it. We've got this floor tile here with some little dog paw prints inside it. And we've also got this really lovely silver coin from the Emperor Trajan dated to about 98 AD. What about structures? Well, actually, we're getting a really nice sequence of events coming up now. And in fact, you actually walked through where the entrance would be when you came in the trench down that plank, just over there. We've got demolition phases here, right here in front of me. Then we seem to have the remnants of the original floor surface here. And then under that, we've got the bedding layers. And into that, we've got these two post holes that are being excavated now with a third here that seem to represent an earlier phase of temple. So what's the big story of this trench? Well, I think the key thing might be that head we found yesterday, because I think that could be um, the god or the spirit, the deity, that they were worshipping, that they dedicated this temple to. It meant an awful lot to the people here, enough to build this huge tower and this temple. And Phil has unearthed an even rarer temple, one of the most important buildings we've ever dug on Time Team. Phil, are you confident now that you know what we've got here? Oh, absolutely, Tony. You see this brown soil in front of us? Well, that is like a literally like a garden soil, and it's got first and second century pottery in it. So I don't think that the temple was here, here at that stage. But the floor of the temple, which is literally the surface that we're walking on, we've got third century pottery there on the floor of the temple, which is where we're standing now. And we've got third century coin from the tessellated pavement there. So I'm pretty sure that the temple itself is third century. When you look at the construction of it, you see there we've, we've gone through the wall and you see the depth of the foundations. They are massive. Mm. So imagine just how big the wall above it's going to be. But if you really want massive, have a look at the massive foundation for this main altar or shrine base. It may look like they've just heaved in a load of flints just randomly, but when you actually start to unpick it, you can see that it's alternating layers of flints and chalk. It's all been tamped down time after time, Absolutely. Hasn't it? And, and, of course, you don't build a foundation like that unless you're going to put something absolutely massive on top, like a, an enormous altar or a, a full-size statue. It's seriously big. So we think our temple complex looked like this. In one temple centre was a sacred stone, a focus of devotion for the many who processed around the temple. On the site, Romano-British visitors offered curses and coins, sacrificed animals, and then prayed to the gods at a huge monument inside a circular temple. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. Please join us on this exciting journey. We need more support to make more episodes. Long ago, two Viking marauders captured a lonely nun called Ozith and they chopped her head off. But they say she then picked up her head, carried it back to her nunnery and died there. And this miraculous act of martyrdom earned her a sainthood and the pilgrims flocked in and the local village adopted her name and prospered. Well, that's the story. This little town on the Essex coast is still called St Ozith, but its real origins are a mystery and the locals have called in Time Team to help them find out when and where their town really began. We begin our quest for the origins of this town on the waterfront. Geophys are testing a peculiar lump between the timbers and the shore. 
But the mud isn't going to give up its secrets that easily. There's a rich trading history on this part of the Essex coast, and St Osyth, just five miles from the ancient city of Colchester, is proud to have been a small port since the Norman times. In 1121, work began on a huge priory dedicated to St Osyth, and it's likely a medieval town would have sprung up around the priory, but we don't know that. Not many gardens here. Our task is to establish where the early town of St Osyth was at the time the priory was built. Carenza will mastermind the hunt for the medieval town, so Matt and Bridget and the locals are going to sink lots of test pits to see if there are signs of occupation. In the garden of the Red Lion pub, Matt's looking for rubbish pits at the back of some of the early properties. These might contain the remains of domestic pottery. Can you see that? There's a bit of a brick there or something, so that's a piece of a brick or tile. So there's, there's evidence that, that you know, people have been living and doing stuff here already. There are two test pits behind the butcher's house. This Victorian wall might have been the frontage for small market stalls. Buildings like each side of the alleyway come to here, there's a gap. So um, there must have been something here once. In addition to our test pits, we're digging here at one of the earliest properties in St Osyth. It looks like a wealthy merchant's house, and we think there could have been craftsmen's workshops at the back. Okay. You can start troweling on this and see if you can see anything you think's man-made. You've got a little tray. This is ready. Stacks of finds, but nothing early enough to prove our town started here. So what dates the building then? Well, the building apparently dates from about the 1300s, the earliest bit, but that's from an architectural survey done before, so I think we ought to get our expert to have a look at it. Yeah, but it, it does mean we should find that sort of thing in the garden. We should do, it? and hopefully we'll be out beyond the edge of the medieval house and yeah. into the garden area where we might find rubbish from, you know, rubbish pits or yeah. boundaries or anything like that, so we're optimistic. Ah, oh, that's a piece of stoneware. That's quite interesting. This is um, a kind of pottery that comes into, into Britain Probably from the 16th century is the earliest stuff from, from cool. Europe. So that could be an early date, but there's just not enough of it to be able to say. Yeah, that's nice. Cool. At the butchers, Matt's off at a cracking pace. So it's quite a bit higher, isn't it, the ground surface here? So you must have had a lot to go through. Yeah, yeah, we have. The road is actually a bit higher on that side as well. The whole thing, I thought, oh, slowed gosh. down. <laughs> but it turns out that most of this here is actually, there's a huge amount of topsoil in here been brought in. However, about a metre down, the top of there, you can see we've got this quite crude wall structure. Just right, We've just managed to catch the edge of it there, so it's pretty luckily placed. That and it's medieval. It's block built and there's yeah. flint in it. That looks very much like some of the other medieval walls. Exactly. Among the plethora of finds... Pretty sure it's medieval. Oh, that's fantastic. I think that's our first bit of yeah. medieval. So there's some sort of later medieval settlement up here, but do finds like this tell us the town grew up around the new priory? The tide has turned in the creek. In a couple of hours, the timbers will be completely submerged. Phil's cleared the mud from the bottom of the timbers and has found tool marks where the stakes have been sharpened. At this stage, it's impossible to tell how old the wooden structure is or what it is. To the side of the timbers, there's a steep slipway. Phil's found a layer of gravel mixed up with river mud sitting on top of a curving outcrop of clay. This looks like the bottom of the creek bank. I mean, this last night was my trench, wasn't it? Yeah. Look at it now. What's happened? Well, the tide came in, didn't it? Well, you must have expected that. You were the one who said to me, this is about in, out, in, out, in, out over three days. Yes. Yeah, but we didn't actually expect it to come in this, this, this hole. I mean, I was reliably informed this was going to be a neap tide, and apparently neap tides mean that it don't, they don't come in as, as hoey. But look, it's just inundated everything. It's a mess. So what are you going to do, Raksha? Well, there isn't anything that we can do, really. We just have to clean it up and start all over again. <laughs> By now, pretty well all of our test pits have hit the bottom, and there's still a horrible gap of 300 years between the founding of the Priory in 1121 and our 15th century finds in the town. What do you think's going on, Matt? Well, the only explanation really is that we're in the wrong place and the, the centre of medieval St Osyth is not actually here on this side of the Priory. Do you think that's right? 
I don't think it was here at all. I think we've got the Priory over there. We've got the um, harbour, the creek over there. If you're going to do a town, you're going to put your settlement near those things. So that's going to be pushing it over the other side of the Priory. Plus an old house here. This is the oldest recorded building, 1300s. Absolutely no medieval whatsoever. The features suggest agriculture. So this could just be a farmstead with the settlement over there. Paul, I have to say that isn't the noises that Mick and Carenza were coming out with this morning. Well, it might not be, but whenever I've seen pottery assemblages from a medieval town or, or settlement of any size, you invariably find lots of early medieval pottery mixed up in the late medieval and early post-medieval deposits. That just isn't happening here. There's not one single scrap of medieval pottery before the 15th century, apart from one church of Saxon. If I, looking at this, I can't see how there could be any medieval archaeology here before the 15th century. It just doesn't look right. It just doesn't look as if there is any. Back by the creek, Mick's gamble hinges on the geophysics. And quite understandably, John's a little nervous. It's kind of, we're losing it here, we'll have to clean this back a bit. There's this massive great blob here, so I'm wondering if we've got a couple of intercut rubbish pits or something. It's domestic rubbish, it's tile, it's shell, bits of pottery. One shirt is 12th century, really? definitely, yeah. Maybe slightly earlier, it could be Saxo-Norman. Well, I think that's a victory. Fitting. Um, I think you got it right, John. Do you want that in writing? <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish pits could mean houses. John's identified seven anomalies. So Paul's here, Phil's here, and Raksha's finds suggest there was shipbuilding here. You seem to have found your anomalies. There's lots of metal and nails and things. That's all within this pit. That's all within this pit. So you did well on your geophysics this time, then, John. Keep saying that. <laughs> I'm on a victory tour at the moment. A, a what? A victory tour. Victory tour. Well, if you're in so victorious a mood, what have you got on your printout for this? This is actually the anomaly. It's one of the strongest we've got. Okay. I mean, it looks like a uh, fired brick. I wonder whether it's not a furnace, uh, uh, a, a smithy. Oh, well, that would be... Because... That would be... Because... Oh. Look what I'm getting. Lots of clinker and stuff like that, masses of it. And that and it's isn't all, flint, it, is it? it <laughs> no, John, that's not Flint. But it's all it's all coming in here. Just as we predicted. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> in the river, we thought we'd got a 17th century dock. But Gus has got other ideas. These piles are not straight. They're all twisted at various angles. That one over there is seriously twisted. These ones here, if I may just wade into the water, uh, this one here, I've actually got the bottom of. You can see it's got this nice, sh nice chamfer on the bottom there, which means these piles were driven in at about that height. So only that metre or so was actually standing proud of whatever river level was there then. We've lost all the front half, and you can see that over there. You can see where that broken plank is. You can see very clearly that we've lost the front half of the structure. So Alan is actually standing on the front of the structure. He is the riverfront. This is the middle of the riverfront. We're in the middle of uh, a waterfront feature. What about dating? Well, the dating seems to have come, all that pottery you're talking about, seems to have come from the bottom of these erosion levels. OK? So that pottery dates the erosion of the feature, the demise of this structure, the collapse of the front, not its construction. So we know when it ended and we know how it ended, but what we don't know is when it was built and what it really looked like and what it was for. Gus, basically, you're telling me that yesterday evening we had a nice little story, a beginning and a middle and an end, about what this wood was, and now you're kicking the whole thing wide open again. That's right. Thanks, mate. <laughs> no problems. But at least this enigmatic structure could be a lot older and could tie up with the story of St Osith. With just two hours to go, the vicar's persistence has finally paid off. A metre and a half below the surface, he's produced the most important finds in the town. I can finally say you've got back before the 15th century in the medieval period. <laughs> only I'm just, lost. only just, but you're, you're back there before it. Right, so what have we got? That's significant? Well, we've got these three fairly small sherds, but they're enough to keep me happy. Basically, we've got this, which is a sherd of late London work, probably 14th century. We've got this, which is a sherd of early German stoneware, probably about 1350 and this, which is uh, Dutch medieval pottery, the generic term for it is Ardenburg ware, but again, 14th century. 
this is exactly the sort of thing I'd expect to see in a medieval port town. You go over to Holland or you're coming over from Holland, you fill the hold of your boat with, with expensive goods for trade, you have a spur corner, you stick something in like a basket of pots or whatever. It's, it's not a big profit, but it's better than just wasting space. Wasted space is wasted money as far as the merchants are concerned. So this is exactly what I'd expect to see. Yes, I'm happy now. <laughs> <laughs> These are terrific finds, and Paul's convinced that the wealthy end of town was up by the Priory. But there's still no proof that an earlier settlement began to develop up here at the time the Priory was built. Down at the workman's end of town, Phil has confirmed there was industry alongside the creek, but it's much later. What you've actually got is a flue. That's this dark yep. stuff, and it actually comes right the way through here. Now, it's got a wall on that side and a wall on that side. And as the flue comes through, when it gets to here, it widens out on that side and on that side into a major chamber. That's what I'm actually standing in. Now, when we actually found it, I thought, oh, it's going to be a furnace or something like that, maybe even a smithy. But now I've actually got in it, I realise it's far more substantial than ever I, I imagined. And I think it must be a kiln or something like that. What I don't know is how old it is. How are you on bricks? <laughs> um, well, this is a handmade brick, not, not a machine-made one. It's slightly smaller in dimensions than your average modern That's brick. That's what I thought, yeah. And it hasn't got those uh, the, the characteristic indentations. The frog. The, the, the frogs in the top, which you use for putting them in water. So that this is uh, potentially a Tudor or early Stuart brick, uh, 16th century, early 17th at tops. Could it be contemporary with our wharf out there? Broadly, it is contemporary with it, yeah, I would guess. It would be a very convenient place to actually offload a barge or something like that, bringing in raw materials or maybe taking away finished products. Well, I couldn't help noticing that in your tray here, you actually have um, um, a bit of nail with a, a washer. That's the roll. This is the, um, the diamond-shaped rove that you use to clench two planks of a barge or bait together. So you couldn't sail very far on that, but provided you got the wood to go with it, that would make a nice little barge. Well, that row of end came from a trench just over there. So, I mean, it looks like we do have boat building on the site as well. Or boat destruction, yes. So this, this is a used boat rivet. Right. So, um, which means that they've had a barge and broken it up. And that presumably is undateable. Virtually, yes, but except the fact that the Clinker building using th these rows, uh, you know, things like the M M Mary Rose don't use these. The Mary Rose sunk in 1545. Um, they went on to Carvel building there, so this could be earlier than the 16th century, but um, some ships and barges still used rows like this through to about the 17th century or so. This morning, Mick was confident we'd find workshops and industry along the edge of this creek, and we have, roughly 16th century from the Tudor period. But the 12th and 13th century settlement of St. Osyth is still as elusive as ever. In the first trench we opened yesterday afternoon, we found a cluster of mysterious rubbish pits. And now the trench is finished, Mick's delighted. We've got evidence of buildings in here. Can you see the sort of light-coloured patch across that area there? Can I get in? Yeah, yeah. When you say light-coloured patch, you mean this? That, yeah, that's, What's that? That, that's mortar, so there's, a, there's been a wall or a wattle and daub structure there. Yeah. There's a cobbled surface outside it. Look where the, the smaller stones this are. This kind of pea gritty thing. That's right, that's, yeah, not, that's yeah. not natural. And then behind you, we've got a post hole in the bottom of a trench that's going away from it that's full of oyster shells. Yeah. Uh, oysters, of course, important part of the diet then, not quite the luxury we think of today. So does that mean we've got a building? Yeah, we've got a building here. Or an oyster bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've got a building, you know. One of probably many that went across the site. But we've got no date. Well... Well, we have. I mean, <laughs> most of the pottery that's coming from these features is 15th century. Then we're no nearer finding the medieval than we were, are yes, we? Yes, we are, because we've got lots of residual pottery. Yeah. That's earlier pottery that's mixed in into later features. And we've got everything from the 11th century through to the 15th century. We've got the full range of medieval pottery. Not only that, we've got imported stuff. We've got things like this. Uh, that's part of a 13th century French jug. This is exactly the sort of thing we'd expect to see in an East Coast medieval port. But you see he's got this silly grin on his face. We've, I hadn't well, told you the best yet. Go on. We've got a major <laughs> bonus, which is this. Why is this a bonus? It's a piece of a Middle Saxon German wine jar. 
Is that common? It's very rare. The only sort of places you find these are in Middle Saxon ports, again, mainly on the east coast of England. So are we saying that in the eight or nine hundreds, someone in Germany was importing wine or beer or whatever right to here? Yeah, it was important enough for a German merchant to come up the creek, bringing this sort of thing with them. So given the evidence that we've got, yeah. and it's not comprehensive, is it? Are you prepared to say that we've got a Saxon settlement? Oh, I think so, yeah. We've got a complete range of the pottery. We've got structures which almost certainly go on in each direction. That's enough to show us we've got a settlement of that early medieval period. So our elusive St. Osith settlement is elusive no more. The earliest occupation started down by the river, and this would have been a busy port in Saxon times. We're sure that the mysterious timbers that Alan Williams brought us here to see were part of a dock or slipway used to load and unload cargo. But the terrible flood of 1663 would have devastated the waterfront at St. Osith and wiped out many small businesses. The shipwrights, sailmakers and blacksmiths would also have lost their houses and the old port of St. Osith would have changed forever. Time Team is 100% independent and funded by our incredible fans. Want us to make more episodes? Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models, masterclasses and more. And you get to have your say in the process as we develop new sites. In early 2006, a light aircraft flew across the north coast of Anglesey on an aerial survey of the island. Then the photographer spotted something strange and took this photo. It revealed a massive earthwork about the length of two football pitches and on an island that was once home to one of history's most mysterious groups, accused of magical rituals, human sacrifice, even cannibalism, the Druids. So what exactly is this strange earthwork? As usual, we've got just three days to find out. Mick, we've got this huge site here, clearly visible. Yeah. And yet nobody's ever dug it. That seems a puzzle to me. Not only have they never been dug, but they've hardly been recognised. Even the great survey of Anglesey done in the 1930s just said a few scrappy earthworks mainly destroyed. Are they mostly destroyed? <laughs> no, it doesn't look like it, does it? I mean, there's huge great banks and ditches. Have you any idea what period it is? Well, they just suggested it might be Roman, but I don't think we know, really. Dating this massive earthwork's going to be critical. If it's Roman, then it's the product of one of the bloodiest episodes in Welsh history. In AD 61, the full force of the Roman army descended on this small island. Their mission, to destroy the stronghold of the British resistance, an insurgency led by the Druids. In a merciless attack unprecedented on British soil, they massacred the Druids and their followers and burnt down their sacred oak groves. But if our earthwork was built before the Roman invasion, then it could be a remnant of the very people the Romans set out to destroy, a relic of a lost world dominated by the Druids. So we put in three trenches over the large rectangular feature. Phil opens a trench over what looks like the entrance. Matt looks inside the rectangle in the hope of finding evidence of settlement. And Bridge opens a trench across what Mick thinks might be a stone rampart. We'll have two bucket widths from there, that shoulder, that line. Go, let's do it. The relentless elements have made the ground bone dry. Digging's going to be tough. Just there, you've got the natural where it comes over the rise. Yeah. And you've got the natural there, just in between there. That's not some sort of ditch. Where? Oh, look at that. He, he spotted that. He felt it in the you finger. You should swap jobs, I think. No. <laughs> hey! <laughs> Phil, with more than a little help from Ian, has uncovered what appears to be the entrance to the enclosure. The ditch across the front would have made it impossible to approach the entrance directly. It looks defensive, but is it Roman or Iron Age? An imperial fort 
are the last refuge of the Druids. I know we've got evidence of Iron Age Celts in this part of the country, but do we actually have tangible evidence of Druids? If you go over to a, another corner of, of the island, to RAF Valley Anglesey, back in the 1940s, workmen, not archaeologists, discovered in the peat, where there had once been a lake, uh, cl close on 150 objects of iron and bronze. And we have um, some replica examples here and some images. This image of a bronze decorative plaque. Think of this as the Mercedes-Benz sign on the front of your fancy car, but put this on the front of your wagon or chariot. And the question is, who was directing the dumping, now let's use a better word, deposition, gifting of these objects, including um, swords, they'd been bent and broken before they were thrown into the lake. Who was doing that? So this is what Francis would call ritual deposition, just like you have on your own site at Flag Fen over in Cambridgeshire. Yes, absolutely. This is, this is one of the classic ritual sites. Uh, throughout Britain and Europe, you, you have deposition of offerings into bogs and wet places. It is a religious activity. Mm. And it's only towards the end of that period, in the last three or so centuries, that it actually gets attributed to the Druids. They were the blokes doing the mm. stuff. We've put a trench over some exposed stones that Mick thinks could be a rampart. Bridge has cleaned them up, and they're looking good. Mick, this is fantastic. We don't usually find archaeology like this on day one. It looks we? very impressive, doesn't it? Yeah. But it's not what we're looking for at all. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I thought it was probably part of some sort of Iron Age rampart structure. Sure. Well, of course, the problem is it's outside the enclosure. It's the wrong side of it. And it now looks as if it's the end of a barn or a building going off in that direction. And it turns out to be much more to do with a post-medieval farm site. <laughs> post-medieval? <laughs> Round yeah. about when, do you reckon? 1800, something like that, probably. <laughs> if you look at that enclosure on the map, and you yeah. look at this bottom half badly affected by later ploughing, and that being post-medieval farm, then yeah. our best bet for getting the outline of this enclosure is going to be up the top there. Yeah. Have you Got followed it. this so I've far? I've followed it so far. Could you explain it back to me so that I understand? <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully, we'll find something in this field to help us date our site. Because so far, these are our only finds, and dating them is proving difficult. We've called in find specialist Kai Payton to take a look. Initially, when those coins were dug up, everyone was saying Roman, Roman, possibly early Roman, really exciting. But then these waves of doubt began to hit us. Or oh, maybe it's not a coin at all. <laughs> are they coins? Are well, they the, Roman? The good news is they are coins. They are Roman. One of them could potentially be quite early and one of them might be a little bit later. This one here, looking at the size and what it's made of, this looks like it's what they call a Cistercius, which could be as early as first century, maybe even a little bit earlier. But this one, I mean, it's in grotty condition, but it looks like a coin called an ass. So it's a grotty ass. And it's, it's made of some kind of a very coppery alloy, which is why it's sort of blue in the middle. It looks like quite an early coin, so this could well be a first century coin about, you know, the time of the invasion here. I think, as Kai says, they've been, they've been around for a long time. They've mm. circulated for a while. So you don't think that the early coin was being clutched in the hand by a Roman warrior as he murdered the Druids on this very spot? I think it's possible, but I have to say unlikely. <laughs> In fact, the coins are so worn, they could have been in circulation long after the Romans invaded, several hundred years after they'd wiped out the island's druids. Their brutal campaign was so successful that today it's easy to think the druids are more myth than reality. If someone mentions druids nowadays, we tend to think of hippies in white sheets on Salisbury Plain, don't we? But do we have much tangible evidence that they actually existed in ancient times. We must be careful because whose territory are you on now? You're in Wales and we have living druids, our own intelligentsia, who come together for our big cultural festival. Yes, but those kind of druids are just an 18th century conceit, aren't they? That's, that's a fantasy, no, isn't it? Tony, our druids today are our intelligentsia in Wales 
uh, they are musicians, but also think of those poets and those people who continue oral traditions. So mm -hmm. then maybe we, we have a route into prehistory, into the pre-Roman periods as to how these people behaved and what their special roles were. Why do we think they were an intelligentsia? Well, there's, there's plenty of documentary evidence. Caesar tells us that the Druids in Gaul, France today, which he happened to be conquering at the time, uh, that they came over to Britain uh, to study. That is the best teaching, the best source of learning. So what was this knowledge that they were imparting? Well, I mean, there seem to have been three types of Druids. Basically a priesthood and then soothsayers, sometimes called ovates or vates from the Latin, and bards, and it's the bards we see a lot of in Wales because they're the poets and the singers and, and the artists. But we can broaden their role, you know, were they the scientists, you know, we use, it's a modern term, scientists. They were uh, foretellers of the future. Um, we are also told that battles between the native peoples, the pre-Roman peoples, their own peoples, they'd come in as actual peacemakers. Mm. So they knew that they're playing many roles. But that's not how the Romans saw the Druids, is it? They saw them as blood-drinking cannibals. Tony, as you know, the natives didn't do the writing. It's the Romans who tell us the story. It's a story that includes blood-curdling accounts of elaborate human sacrifice. But is that just Roman propaganda? Or could the Druids really have conducted such ceremonies? From his hilltop home, the Iron Age chieftain who ruled this corner of Anglesey could see the source of his power, economic and spiritual, laid out before him. And he made sure that anyone looking back could see it too. If you remember, the geofish showed another ditch yeah. on the outside of the main big ditch. So we put this trench in, and what we discovered wasn't what we thought. It wasn't another ditch. Right. But we came across these big rocks. We yeah. found about five of these, and they went in, the, in a line across the trench here. So I put an extension in. Yeah. And I think that's the foot of a wall. So you got a wall through here. We got a wall. This, in other words, the bank that accompanied the big ditch yeah. had a revetment, right. stone revetment. To stop all this stuff tipping it over. Yes, but yeah. it, well, I mean, we've just got the bottom of it. It may well have been higher. Yeah. In which case, you could have seen a stone wall down there in the valley. Yeah. And it would have looked you know, really spectacular. And it sort of enhances this impression that this is a very high status, important site. It would have looked like a fort on the yes. horizon, wouldn't it? Yes. yes. Yeah. yeah. In an imposing structure like this, we'd expect to find substantial houses. But so far, the only sign of Iron Age occupation is a series of small post holes. They don't look much, but Mick and Francis are impressed. It's probably the best evidence we're going to get for settlement on this site, for actual buildings and structures, isn't it? Yes, but dating them with any precision is impossible, other than by absence of pottery. But they're right in the centre of our enclosure, yeah. which is where we know they ought to be. So they're at the centre of power, if you like. And if we could join them all up into coherent pattern, I think we'd find there would be roundhouses about sort of eight metres diameter, yeah. thatched roof, yeah. that sort of thing. But the posts can't have been very big. They're pretty small. No, holes. but I think the problem is, you see, we're seeing just the bottom bit yeah. of the post hole. All the rest of it, the actual foot or more in which the post has been eroded by ploughing across this site. We're right at the bottom of them. So you're happy that there were actually Iron Age people building shelters here, not just putting up fences? Well, yes. I think it's more than shelters. I yes, it's houses. It's, this would be a substantial house, you know, the way people have reconstructed. They're quite substantial buildings. And at nearby Mellon Clernon, a team of experimental archaeologists and modern builders are demonstrating just how substantial. Their reconstructions show these were simple but brilliant designs. Carefully placed posts bore the weight of the roof and defined the large communal space. And a thatched roof would have kept out the very worst Welsh weather. It was the perfect house for this hill, a substantial weatherproof home fit for even the most powerful chieftain. So is the mysterious pit next door another part of this domestic picture? 
Going down. Yep. That's going down. Yeah. Yep. Even Francis wouldn't get this excited about a rubbish pit. Oh, this is looking oh, good. Yeah, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But hang on, I see another of these yellowy stones just yep. under there. There, yeah. 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 Right, so what it looks like then, Francis, is a kiss. So it'll be a, a little grave, yeah, possibly, lined with stone and probably, what, Bronze Age, early Bronze Could Age? Be. Well, it certainly is an appropriate size and shape for a crouched inhumation. If yeah. you know yeah. so much about it, do you really want me to bother and dig it? <laughs> <laughs> This is completely unexpected. Looking for signs of Iron Age settlement, it seems we found a Bronze Age grave, not two, but 4,000 years old. The oval grave was lined with large flat stones. The body would have been curled up inside. It seems the acidic soil has destroyed the bones, but the discovery helps us rewrite the history of this hill. We're saying those post holes are about 2,000 years old, and that burial is about 4,000 years old. In other words, the people who were looking at that burial were as far away from it in time as we are from the Romans. But think now, if there were a heap of stone over this burial pit, yeah. It was there, it was being respected by the builders of these new houses. It's odd, isn't it? Because for us, special places like churches and synagogues and, and what have you tend to be very much separate from our everyday lives, and yet that seems to be right in the middle of our age everyday life. But then, as, as we all know, the landscape has changed and the way we read the landscape has changed. And I think we've lost so much meaning in terms of, you know, the specialness of the hill, the ancestors who have worked this land for millennia. And that's the mindset, I believe, that these people had. And, of course, we were advised by those special people, those druids who were helping us to um, make sense of history. Three days ago, this earthwork was almost unheard of. One of the few clues to its existence was a photograph. Now we've uncovered 4,000 years of history on this Welsh hillside. It begins with one person, buried but not forgotten. Because 2,000 years later, this hill was still a special place, the power base for an important chieftain. It gave him a link to the past, shelter, food, even a sacred lake. He had it all. And then the Romans arrived. Life on Anglesey and on this hill changed forever. The curiously empty ditches suggest wind and rain began to fill them with earth soon after the invasion. The roundhouse post holes were covered by a blanket of soil and a Roman coin dropped on top. It seems the chief and his people vanished and the once mighty earthwork was abandoned. The roundhouses fell into disrepair or were even demolished. And the terrifying events of the Roman invasion were hidden beneath gentle pasture. This exposed hill bears witness to the island's darkest hour. David, it's really come on, isn't it? Yes, it has. Uh, growing nicely. We're almost on the last stage. Despite dry willow and strong winds, Dave and his team have proved it would have been possible for the Iron Age Celts to build a wicker man. Let me show you the head. Does that remind you of anybody? As Dave puts the finishing touches to our wicker man, it's easy to forget that 2,000 years ago, this would have been a gruesome spectacle. But stuffed with straw instead of humans, it's far from terrifying. In fact, it feels strangely familiar. Phil certainly seems to be feeling a connection. <laughs> it's tempting to find faint echoes of this ancient custom in our modern traditions, from corn dollies and the green man to Guy Fawkes. How much of the ancient British way of life did the Romans really destroy? How much do we owe to that elusive elite, the Druids? Hello, 
my name's John Gator. Time Team is fan funded by Patreon. This vital support helps us to make new episodes. Joining Patreon gives you access to exclusive interviews, 3D models and masterclasses, plus lots more.